Either way, the protection of the community is for there to be obedience to the authority that is placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Protection lies in obedience to Allah, lies in obedience to the Prophet, and lies in obedience to those placed in authority after the Prophet. So these are the ten basic teachings or the ten shares of Islam and what purpose they are to accomplish within society. Salawat. So with that, we will move now to another section or group of a hadith, and this is also something which we have many a hadith about, but we will just look at one or two that are illustrative of some of the principles that the Imams emphasized for their followers. And this is the definition or the essence of Iman. This is something which our Imams, they actually had debates with even among their own followers because the essence of Iman, it was something which was misunderstood by many people, not just by the general population of Muslims, but even sometimes by people who were followers of the Imams. And the basic principle that the Imams established is that Iman in its essence is not an outward attribute. Well, you belong to this group, you have a membership card, therefore you are mu'min. You don't have a membership in this group, therefore you are not a mu'min. That is a superficial definition. It may be used in certain legal contexts because there is an element of Islam. One level of Islamic teachings is legal obligations, societal obligations. But in essence, what is Iman? This is a hadith from our fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad Baqir alayhi salatu wassalam. Everything that comes from being submissive and admitting to the truth, to be able to do iqrar when we know something is true. Iqrar is a word that all of us are familiar with, i'tiraf or iqrar, to admit something when it is true. You know it's the truth, so you can bring yourself to admit it. Taslim to submit. Not to say, well, yes, that's true, but, and then have a whole explanation of why we're not going to accept it. So that is the essence of Iman. And everything that comes from or that is brought by juhud, obstinance, and inkar, denial, that is kufr. You know something? My heart knows it's to, it is true, then I say, forget it. I'm not going to accept it. Or I can't bring myself to submit to it. As the Quran says that there are people, They denied the signs of Allah and the truth, even though their heart knew that this is not something which is false. So the essence of Iman and Kufr is admitting what we know to be true or what has been proven for us, or denying what we know to be true. And that is why the essence of Iman and Kufr, it may not always be in exact accordance with that superficial legal definition. There may be some people who apparently seem to be mu'min, but they do not have that attribute of submission. And there may be people who have not heard about Islam enough to have accepted it, but they are submissive and accept whatever truth has come to us, has come to them, and therefore they have that spirit of Iman within them, that spirit of believing in the truth. Sometimes Allah has told us to interact with people on the basis of legal obligations because we're establishing a community and we don't know what's in people's heart. But at the same time, we should leave the judgment of people's hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He will judge people based on what is the essence of Iman and what is in their hearts. And that is why as Muslims, at least as followers of Ahlul Bayt, unlike some other Muslim groups, and unlike other religions, we don't tell people who is going to heaven and who is going to hell. Because that's not our job. Allah will judge, and He will judge based on His infinite knowledge of what is in people's hearts. This was a major principle which our Imams emphasized, and because we are just summarizing a few of the ahadith, then we will not uh, have time to... Uh, look at many of those ahadith in detail. But the essence of Iman, it is submission. The essence of kufr is rejection 
So we should make sure that we do not just get lost in the label, but we have that spirit of Iman and that essence of Iman within ourselves. Salawat. And we have time for one more hadith. This is a hadith in which our sixth Imam mentions the uh, effect of major sins on a person's life. There are some sins which in Islam we know of as major sins. Different definitions have been given by ulama, either those sins which Allah has given a promise that he will punish them because they are so severe, or sins that are mentioned in the Quran specifically, or other definitions that have been given. But those major sins, some of which are very clear and agreed upon, like uh, infidelity, like uh, murder, these kinds of major sins. What, does the effect that these sin, what is the effect these sins have on a person's faith? <coughs> this goes back to a debate that existed in early Islam. <coughs> Some people said, that if a person commits a major sin, they're no longer a Muslim. This was the belief of some Muslims. Others said that whatever a person does, they're still a mu'min, their belief makes them a mu'min, and their sin, that then is something that Allah will decide about. But it has no effect on their faith. This was the group known as the Murji'ah, the Murji'ites. So the Imams, they had a balanced and a teaching that was somewhere in the middle. They said there is a difference between Iman and Islam. If a person commits a major sin, they're no longer a mu'min. Because these major sins, in another hadith which we won't have time for, Allah says that He curses people who commit those major sins. And the Imams say that Allah will never curse in the Qur'an somebody who is a mu'min. But they are still a Muslim. As long as they don't consider that sin to be halal. So if they repent, they can return to Iman, and because they are Muslim, they still have the apparent protections and identity that Islam brings. But we shouldn't demean the importance of obedience to Allah by saying nothing has changed. They're just as they were before, they're still a believer. So the hadith is as follows. Uh, one of the prominent companions of uh, our sixth Imam, Abdullah ibn Sanan, he says to the Imam, that uh, if a person commits a major sin and dies, what is that person's state? Are they no longer Muslim? Can we pray on them? Can we uh, bury them in a Muslim graveyard or not? And if the person is to be punished, then is he punished as a kafir or is he punished as something less than that? So the Imam replied that من ارتكب كبيرة من الكبائر فزعم أنها حلال if a person does a major sin and says that this is permissible, أَخْرَجَهُ ذَلِكَ مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ That person is not a Muslim. If you commit a major sin and you say that, well, it's not part of Islam, then you have denied a tenet of Islam. وَأُذْذِبَ أَشَدَّ الْأَذَابِ And that person will be punished the harshest punishment, just like unbelievers. وَإِنْ كَانَ مُعْتَرِفًا أَنَّهُ ذَنْبِ but if the person believes that yes, this is a sin, it is improper, وَمَاتَ عَلَيْهِ But they, prefer, they still make the mistake, they fall to temptation, and they were not able to repent. Another ahadith that mentions that if the person repents, then they can return to the state of iman, the higher state. But if they don't repent, أَخْرَجَهُ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ وَلَمْ يُخْرِجْهُ مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ That takes them out of iman, but it doesn't take them out of Islam. So in terms of how you are to deal with them, their body, their final remains, their wasiyyah, their inheritance, their family, and all of those areas, you are still to treat them as a Muslim. وَكَانَ عَذَابُهُ أَهْوَنَ مِنْ عَذَابِ الْأَوَّلِ And in this case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also will not punish them that severe punishment that He would punish a person who denies the truth. So here the Imams, they mention what is the proper understanding of the nature of sin. There is always a path of return, but we should not take it lightly for ourselves or for others. It does remove a person from Iman and it brings them down to that border where they are within the border of Islam, but they are not regarded by Allah as a mu'min. They are not worthy of those special blessings that Allah has for the mu'mini. 
Insha'Allah, in the coming weeks, we'll continue with a few more ahadith regarding 